let's go ahead and call the meeting to order. And um, in terms of the previous moments, Tracy, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to sign tonight, obviously. Um, but anyone see any corrections for the previous January minutes, or anyone like to make a motion to approve? I'll motion to approve. Okay, I'll go ahead and second that. And hopefully I'll be able to be in person at the next meeting. Um, so I can sign for December and January. Uh, any members from the public? I don't think so, but since I'm not there, I might be able to see someone. Any members from the public who would like to be speak at this point? There's no no one here, thanks. Okay, and I could not remember who signed up for the monthly I speaker. Rihanna, is that you? Yep, it was. So for this month, um, if folks could share their favorite movie or CD or kind of on something other than a book that you found in the library. And so I'll just go ahead and start. Um, for a movie, um, I found Kontiki, which is about, is based on a true story where someone was trying to prove that it was possible to, that um, for the population of the Polynesian islands for them to have sailed um, there. And so he built a craft and um, proved that it was possible. And so that the whole movie is like his journey to prove everybody wrong. So. Okay, I'll jump in next. This is not media. But I unfortunately did not make it out this weekend, but I've so enjoyed seed packets from the library in the past and look forward to, to checking those out this year. I can go next. So I just now realized that um, kind of some classic musicals are not necessarily in the children's section. I kind of assumed that if it was rated G, it would be in the kids' section, and that's not the case. And so, like, Sound of Music, Annie, Newsies, they're upstairs, and our family recently discovered that, and we watched Annie recently. So, I don't know that I have a specific single DVD, no. but it was 2003-2004, somewhere in there, and I was living on my own in this tiny, no way could have been a le could have been legal, like trailer apartment kind of shack in the woods um, in. New York State and I was working at the Valley Cottage Library and I was new to that library which was not a humongous library but very beloved by uh, the community and they had an amazing amazingly curated uh, DVD collection and in particular their foreign films subtitled um, just all over the place and, and as I work there, I, I got to know the, um, the woman who was in charge of developing that collection, and surprise, she was super passionate about foreign films. So while I was living by myself with nothing going on in the woods, I would come home from work with like a stack of DVDs and I would just watch all these foreign films. So that, that still sticks out to me uh, all these years later as some kind of cultural education that I had. That, that year that I was there, um, getting to discover all of these things from outside the United States that I, I, I know I never would have heard about otherwise. Um, it was cool. It was cool. Okay, that's the name of it. So one that I found was Kiss the Ground. It is a documentary um, narrated by Woody Harrelson, 
and our library has it. And uh, it was about, it's, it's basically about, you know, if the soils die, we die. Yes. And so, you know, the carbon, it's not supposed to be up in the air, it's essentially supposed to be in the ground. So carbon, yes, it is good when it's in the soil. And so how, you know, they took, you know, you go back in history to the Dust Bowl and how, you know, these mass agriculture, it's really destroying our, our plains and our natural um, healthy soil. And so how we can reverse reverse that. And it, was, it was really interesting. And I think, you know, as we look at council priorities and, um, you know, what we can do at the local level, considering Longmont has a history of um, agriculture and farming that you know, just kind of tied it in. So I, I was fascinated by that work. That was really interesting. You guys, I saw that too. anything specific but it is sort of a book but also sort of not the blender books that are new to our jewelry collection which other libraries have mm -hmm. um, i use those with my daughter and they're very very fascinating because it's kind of like a read-along story the actual like device that reads the story is in the book mm -hmm. um, so you can kind of listen along and, and actually read the book along with the audio so it's been kind of an interesting experience because i grew up with like the cds where you would listen to the book on a CD with the actual uh, physical book as well. So this is kind of a new modernization of that and it's really interesting to kind of have that like, as an option for the book. Is it, what's it called? They're called Wonder Books? Wonder Books, okay. Yeah, and so last but not least, uh, I'll just say Wonder Books is it's a newer thing mm -hmm. that we've started to receive within the last year. Some of them, yeah. 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 Um, you know, they're 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 certainly not <laughs> the cheapest item um, because it's technology built with the book, yeah. but they're really, really cool and popular. Um, and then Cynthia just since you met I think it was Cynthia that mentioned the seed library, right? Anyway, um, I just want to mention we had our you know kickoff on Sunday for you know, the free seed packet stuff and had over 400 people here on Sunday. It just gets bigger and bigger. And I, and I have to acknowledge that that's uh, in large part funded by the Friends of the Library. Like many things here, but that's a, a huge thing that we couldn't do without them. And we have some sponsors too around that are, are contributing free things to that, uh, for that program. So. After all those plugs and um, everything, um, boy, th this one, I, this was easy for me. I, a, a friend of mine years ago, uh, or a colleague, I should say, when I worked when I lived in Northern California, um, told me about a movie she loved. It's called The Red Violin. I don't know if anyone's heard of this. And. I, so I, I borrowed it from the library and she was just fascinated with it. When she told me about it, it was actually in the theater, but I didn't see it then, I, I waited. And so it's it's really worth finding if you haven't watched it. It's it's truly the story of this violin. It's like that through the violin's life and it's experience with all these people through history. And it, um, and it bounces back between the violins you know, when it's built by this like Italian violin maker, and there's a lot of, I probably shouldn't say I'll give away the story, but it's like, um, and then it bounces to current times where it's being auctioned. <laughs> um, and, and so you hear integrated all these stories. Is that the yes, yeah. Yeah, I, see, I saw that movie like long, long Yeah, because really it's from the early 2000s yeah, for right, sure. Right. Um, Oh, it's such a, it's just such a good story. It still ranks as one of my favorite films to watch. Just just because it's you know you start watching and realizing it's it's really the story of the violin mm -hmm. and the people it affected, right? Not so much. Um, well, that's the story. Anyway, I was last. Move Samuel on. Jackson. And Samuel yeah, Jackson. Yeah, He plays the up. auctioneer in the current time, which was an interesting casting. Thing. Wow. And so you get a little of Samuel Jackson-esque things here and there, you know, with his 
not taken anything from anybody. But it's it's really, but he's also very different. Like if you think of anything he's done, you would never picture him in this role. Cool. Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. Thanks for asking that one. I just took, I just tried to take notes <laughs> um, on some of these. Um, okay, I'm gonna volunteer to do the next one. It's been a while. Um, I'd like to continue to keep this as an agenda item if anyone has different thoughts. Um, I know it does take a little time, but it's lovely to get to know everyone in this manner as well. Um, let's move on now to our more serious business. Um, I put the budget process update under new business, and I hope to bring this up um, under old business in the next few months. Um, just asking them for an update. I know the process, my understanding of the process will start pretty soon. And my hope is that this board will have a strong understanding of what's being requested this year so we can, in our role as an advisory board, really communicate to council um, what we agree with the priorities and uh, hopefully we'll um, be able to learn more about that um, as we talk about it every month. So John, you wanna share us a little bit about the timing in any particulars? Yeah, so, um, well the timing, um, I mean this will be my second year at it, I think for us staff, we, we start um, talking about it and getting the system probably in March, so pretty soon. Um, and, you know, there's a whole timeline and as we get closer I'll share that so that, you know, this board knows of, of deadlines and things coming up. but. Outside of that, what I can share you with you, um, you know, given where this library is, you know, between the election and then my my budget requests, um, effectively none of them getting filled at all. So uh, my intention this year is really to put the exact same budget request back in. Um, there was a lot there, and I'll I'll I'll. Be sure to update this board with, or, or remind this board, I guess, you know, because I did share it last year of what that was. You know, there's a whole slew of budget requests so, uh, between personnel, uh, a high priority supporting outreach with staffing, and funding to support that department, uh, which is now it's still a department of one with no budget except for the person working. Um, and then, um, other, other increases would be to collections across the board, both physical and digital. Uh, pretty substantial increase there, if I remember right, to have us be able to add not just physical, but also digital collections to really meet a population of this size and offerings that we should be providing. Um, you know, and then a number of things throughout, which, which I'll, I'll get into more detail with, with this board um, next time. There was one component of the budget request cycle last year that I put in, uh, which was um, to add like a, it was, it was in addition to what the election would have um, funded, which was a, a full blown branch library, but I also added to my budget request, if you might remember, basically like a, a storefront type of a branch. This year, I will likely leave that out um, that was fairly intentional last year, um, given everything going on. But I, this year, I, I, I need to focus on just the funding of the library and not really trying to add things like that. Um, it, at least that's where I stand right now. But outside of that, it'll pretty much be the same request, which was amounted to somewhere in the seven or eight hundred thousand dollars of budget increase to this our current library. Well, thanks, John. Um, I, I, I didn't expect there to be too much on this this, this uh, meeting. Just wanted to start the conversation, and I think that we can also discuss in the next two meetings. That uh, Susie will will lay the on your guidance as well. Um, help us communicate some of this to council if they want to. Um, try to appear in a meeting that we've emailed in the past. Um, so uh, I think we could craft some of that going forward. Um, I don't have anything else on this agenda item for right now. Does anyone have 
any questions or comments, knowing we'll dive more deeply next time. Jamie, go for it. I have a question. It does not have to be answered right now, but it's more of a, can we think about it? Which is, is there, is there any sense to the strategy of um, sort of narrowing down the budget items that we approach council with to those things that are um, essential and operational and having the items that um, would, would, would definitely benefit for, you could even make a case for needing, but they're not strictly operational, they are like growing, expanding. Um, because when I hear you say that, let's hold off on the storefront, my immediate thought was just like, I, I think that's good because the more that we can um, encourage or persuade council to see Longmont City's role mm -hmm. as really funding operations mm -hmm. for day to day. Um, let's get there first mm -hmm. because that would then create an opportunity for volunteer groups such as the Friends to start to move away toward focusing on advancing the mission and expanding. Yeah. And so it's it's just a baby step toward starting to, to separate those functions yeah. into what I will humbly say for their right purposes. Um, I mean, I, I can address that in part, you okay. know, I think you're right, the storefront, that's, I, I think that'll clog things up, like, in, in the sense of what are my core operational needs. Mm -hmm. As I, I'm trying to visualize the budget requests I have from last year to this year now, that's the only thing out there that I could say is not a critical operational component. Everything else in there is in my life. That's not to say it couldn't still be prioritized, and I did that when I, when when the results of the election came in, and I went and talked to the city manager about all my budget requests. What what if anything can I get? And the answer was zero. But I went in there prioritizing even within that, right. figuring and and so the higher prioritization in there was certainly personnel costs mm -hmm. to to help staff things that we need, right. which is always the most expensive. Then it went down. But you know, if, if I think of it as the bigger picture, it's all there. I mean, we need we need some more staff. We need we need to spend more on collections. We definitely need a programming budget. Yeah. I, I've never. I mean, that's just we've talked about that here before. I mean, that's that's a, a core service and more just like collections. It's been a long standing thing. So the fact that we don't have that, so it would be hard to start outside of the satellite branch where you're going to call it everything else left is pretty much false within what you just said in my mind yeah yeah it's not that you would change necessarily yeah. what you were going to do it's how you talk about it it's the language that you use that, that you could authentically or one could authentically represent that list as for uh, needs yeah. right operational needs like this before anything else and there's a lot of else that that we would really like to have. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's all. Understood. I agree. Okay. Thanks, Jamie and John, for that clarification and context. I think that's a good point, though, too, in how we communicate to the council, um, and especially, you know, besides the the programming is a core component that's not being funded currently. Um, so let's continue the conversation um, on that as well. Any other comments or questions right now about the budget? Great, so let me... Sorry, this is Mary Pam, by the way. We do have a number of public meetings. <laughs> um, a little belatedly and unexpectedly. Um, well, she's not allowed to comment at this point when we ask that. <laughs> but it's, that's fine with me. <laughs> I'm just teasing. I'll let her know. Uh, yeah. 
Pretty, well, like I said, this is really an introduction. We'll bring it up next month. Um, for old business, I, the first two items are really just updates that uh, came from uh, the action item report. Uh, so I didn't put that as an agenda item. I just thought we could maybe discuss a few. If there are other updates from that, uh, please feel free to John. But uh, these were two of the ones that I wanted to touch in about um, to ask if there have been any Last time the conversation was that for St. Brain, Dual Park prospects it pretty much stalled. And so I just wanted to check in to see if there had been any movement. At, at least from my side now, I mean, I had sent um, Susie some the contacts I had had meetings with, um, you know, just, just in case there was any chance. But yeah, it, it, from my standpoint, the last that stood from the district's perspective was it was going to be difficult because they they needed it to be uh, a signature yes. to opt in, and that's how it's been working. When they did the testing, uh -huh. they weren't getting enough parents to sign, and so it's uh, that was the last communication I heard from the district, at least for myself, was they don't see it moving forward unless that changes. Yeah, that was that was essentially I did speak with our city manager because I mean this is an intergovernmental agreement so one of the things so I, I've spoken to the district and they, they told me the same thing that it was going to be really hard to navigate and, um, you know I just kept hearing about reasons why it wasn't going to work but we have signed I mean I remember approving that and I, you know, you have the intergovernmental agreement that is a signed document by both representatives from the city and the school district. So it is a legal binding contract. So, you know, my feeling is we need to, you know, uphold the contract. You know, and looking at and looking at the language on there, it's not very specific about that it has to be one way or the other, an opt in or an opt out. I think preferentially we want the opt out. Is that correct? That's my my yes. thought to yes. make it easier. But I'm not That's, a school yes. board. I'm not a school yes. administrator. So like, and I have noticed that the school district, because when we do Blue Sky Bridge or Grip, traditionally they had been opt outs, and now it seems the last few years are you know under the school district everything is becoming you have to sign the permission slip. And I think what has happened is that in the opt out, maybe kids aren't giving the the parents the the, the paper or something, so they didn't know to even that they could opt out. So I think that there had been some conflict with that. So that's kind of what was the, the feedback I was receiving. So you know, how could we make this? Functional, how can we make this work? Especially for kids, you know, for me it's an equity issue. For kids who least have access to books and, you know, parents being able to take them to, you know, to the bookstore or, you know, pick up those books, that this then provides that, um, that gap, that closes that gap for kids who are least able to to attain those books, or maybe don't have internet at home, so they have to come over here. Yeah. So those, those kinds of issues. I had a wondering about that after we last talked about this um, issue. I don't know if it was at last month's meeting, or um, and it came to me mm -hmm. as, as part of my parenting duties, which is, and I don't know the, the, the IT behind it and everything, but mm -hmm. what I remember hearing is that part of the uh, lack of enthusiasm around the opt-in mm -hmm. was how like the, the system was going to be able to work with opt-outs a lot more easily than it was going to be able to work with opt-outs. Trying to figure out who signed the permission slip. Okay. Is that what you're... Yes. yes. Just okay. like how you, I guess, integrate the data. Mm -hmm. um, but we have, our district has infinite campus. Mm -hmm. And there are certain uh, forms that are created and housed online that parents mm -hmm. are um, may remind
funded and uh, communicated to about completing for various things. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that if you could set that up electronically so that the parent facing piece is you see opt-in or opt-out, mm-hmm. you pick one or the other, and then basically on the back end, as long as everything else was an opt-in, you can just export that opt-out list and, and bring it into whatever. I don't know. I don't know if it's cleaner to do it that way or it gives you more options for uh, for working with the, the responses. I mean, on that specifically, that's a school district issue. Yeah. For, yeah. for importing? For the library standpoint, the technology is there to import all these student IDs. Mm-hmm. But basically, that has to happen, and then they'll know which IDs they can put into basically a file mm-hmm. that, that we take. Okay. So mm-hmm. that, that once it hits the library, that's been worked out. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you're right. It, it's, it could be a technology yeah. issue that can be handled in a way to make it work better. Just like that platform, yeah. Yeah. everything is so in your face. Yeah. And to your point, Susie, yeah. about the um, did the kid ever get, did the parent ever get yes. the thing yes. right? Yes. I have that happen mm-hmm. more than once with my elementary school age child. Uh huh. I said, like, why are we sending papers home in backpacks? Can't you put this in Infinite Campus? And if I forget about it, it, it sends me a reminder or I see right. it when I'm on. Or if the teacher forgets to send home the Thursday folders that then it then become next Monday's folder. Because yeah. <laughs> digital signatures are real. Right. Who does right. that yeah. anymore? I mean the other thing too now. with this is when I was having conversations, because mm-hmm. when this started, this was not necessarily age restricted at all, which uh-huh. is ideal. However, yes. my thought was we're really trying to get digital access mm-hmm. so that they have access to our databases and things like that. Yes. And it was the idea of one of the people from the school district that I was working with in this said, well, maybe we should just make this for high school students initially uh-huh. because then... the school district doesn't place restrictions on content they can access. Okay. I, or on mm-hmm. some level. In comparison, yes, whatever that means, right. which is great in the sense that, because obviously as a public library we don't restrict access to any content. That's up to the to the child's parent guardian, yes. blah blah. blah. Yeah. So if that's the case and it's only high school, mm-hmm. there, there's at least in my mind, and I'm probably oversimplifying this. That makes it a lot cleaner mm-hmm. because you don't have to worry about the younger ages and yes. what content they may be able to access. Because the high school students don't have the same restrictions, mm-hmm. according to what I was told. Mm-hmm. So I really tried to push that in the sense like that's a great idea, and that's who's going to use this stuff the most. Yeah, yeah. I live in and then the other, yeah. all the other students already have access to ebooks through Sora, uh-huh. which is the the Libby yeah. version of yeah. for schools, yeah. and that's already content restricted. Yeah. Like that's yeah. built into how Sora works. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about the, just the library stuff. Yeah. Okay. So, I don't know. That's the the. There's nothing that's developed as far as I know, except for what Susie shared as far as mm-hmm. having some conversations. But. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, Jen and Susie, for those updates. Um, you know, if there is a movement, we can bring it back up. I can. I did solve it. You did solve it. <laughs> I was like, I was saying, so it sounds like we almost have to solve the problem I, for them. I feel like I did. They have, have to say yes to John's solution. Okay. Okay. They have to yeah. accept. I would, solution. but you know, but but to that point, I, yeah. I would be yeah. more than willing to have another conversation or conversations with okay. the powers that be. Uh-huh. Happy to have you and Harold there, or anybody okay. that, that can help. You know, support where I'm coming from and what I what I'm saying it would yes. be to help guide that conversation. I'm sure. more than happy to do that. But uh-huh. um, okay. Okay. Then turn to unmute. Uh, right. Well, thanks for those updates, and hopefully there will be movement um, at some point in the future, and, and we'll 
bring it back up is so. Um, another thing that I know is a long become project is CAPS, a friendly, remember what that stands for, children and teens, um, the shelving update. Uh, so John, if there's anything on that you wanted to share. Yeah, this will be much, much quicker because it's not a hot topic necessarily, but um, um, so we, We've been working with a consultant. We had everything in order um, to get materials ordered. I signed off on it. And then one of the vendors in the, as a part of this is stopping operations of a particular product to another company, or they're moving operations to another state. I can't remember what's happening. So my consultant found a different vendor and they came back with a quote, which is within reason of what we were originally quoted, it's a little bit more, but it would help to not have to wait, because I don't know with this movement of warehouses what that means. I mean, that, that could be a few months and it could be a year for all I know. So I just said move forward with it. I signed off on it. They're confident they can still get everything shipped here in mid-April, by mid-April, all the materials, and then we would be able to, uh, well, they would be able to then move forward with removing all the shelving and have everything done before summer reading, which is the goal. But if there's any delays at all that's going to push materials not getting here till, until May or mid-May, that'll be a challenge and then I'm just going to have to push this until August or September. Not a huge deal. That's not like a year or so out. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least I know where we're standing. But that's um, the update on that. Um, it's going to be fantastic when this is all said and done. Just just to refresh that area, it's it's new shelving. The shelving is the shelves themselves will be a bright white, and then some woods and a lot of color end panels, and then we have some shelving that's on a combo like curved shelving on one side and seating on the other, so that you can actually have story time by the back windows. Um, it, it made a lot of better use of space in that sense, mm -hmm. so I'm excited about it. And so, knock on wood, yeah. there's no um, delays in ordering. As far as I know, the order's been placed. Thanks, Chad. Hopefully, the first time we're meeting. Oh, um, yeah, it, it would be too disruptive to interrupt that. So it's either going to have to be done before that or, or wait until that's over. Any questions or comments on, on those items? Wait, so we, we started talking about this yesterday, or yesterday, oh, uh, last month, <laughs> a long time ago, um, about one month staff. And one of the things we're going to do is pause having staff members come to these meetings. Um, you know, I, I, I would love for us to learn more, but I think it's important to to give them that time. Uh, so, but I just wanted to ask John if there were other movements right now that we should be aware of. I know last time we talked a little bit about limiting some of the tabling and some of the larger city events, um, which we are of course supportive of, um, but kind of what other, what other items or, or areas um, once again, really thinking about burnout and, and trying to protect um, from from all the necessary, um, you know, trying trying to make that balance with the what's necessary and, and what can be cut back right now. Um, so, John, any updates on that? Just a couple, yeah. So, so you're right. I mean, effectively, kind of got paused. I was bringing staff here for some library 101 kind of stuff, which mm -hmm. I would like to continue at some point, but um, it's just a little challenging with <clears throat> everything going on with staffing. And then we've, we've had some turnover recently, so it's it just, you know, every, every month, C Cynthia and I meet a, a week before this meeting and mm -hmm. kind of talk about the agenda. And mm -hmm. I finally just said last week, like, I keep saying like, well, maybe next month, but I have to be realistic and yeah. just say like, let's just table this until I feel like I can bring the staff in here again. Mm -hmm. It's just something I, I can't prioritize right now, mm -hmm. um, even though I know it's it's much appreciated. So we'll get there. Mm -hmm. um, and then as far as uh, festivals, it's an outreach component, right? When we go
go to these big festivals and set up a library booth or a tent, whatever. Um, so I spoke with Lily, our outreach coordinator, about that and, and prioritized some of these events. And, and, and even the ones that we still might go to of how to downsize it to reduce the staff requirement of how we staff those events and the activities we have. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just, we always went at all out for these things. So it's mm -hmm. not just being at like Cinco de Mayo with a tech, but we would be there in a booth with staff and then we have all kinds of games and you can make a craft yeah. and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. and. And I just said, you know, anything like that we do, mm -hmm. um, we need to limit the staff requirement to be there mm -hmm. um, and limit what we're doing. I mean, yeah. we don't really need all that stuff. And, and, and some of this is coming from Lily herself, right, as the outreach coordinator, uh, acknowledging that there's outreach, of the outreach, which is like connecting with people when she mm -hmm. goes to the parks mm -hmm. and, and the schools. And the schools. Yes. And then these are our festivals, as she calls them, which it's great for the visibility, but but really the return on investment of that isn't really as great. Mm -hmm. It's not that it's not valuable. Right. And with all the staffing and everything we needed, I would be happy to be at all of them. Yeah. But it's um, it's just not something. So there'll be a number of them that we probably won't participate in that level mm -hmm. this year. Um, one of one of them is. And some of this is a trade-off, I should add, too. So if you think about a, a big city event like Rhythm and Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. So last year, um, the library did two things. Not only did we have a booth that had crafts and, and required no less than 12 staff for the day, we also had to staff it to help just with the event itself because it's so big, yeah. right? So we had people helping with volunteers. Mm -hmm coordinating that or other other tasks that that as a to part, as a division of recreation and culture we need to help recreation yes. staff with these. Yes. So if I remove the tabling part I have more staff to help with the actual event which is truly what's needed. Okay. And it's and it's valuable. And rhythm specifically, I mean people are going there to use it. Yeah. Enjoy food trucks. They're not and, and the library visitors are that come to the tent. They're already library visitors. We're yeah. not. We're not garnering new. Any new people. Yeah. So that's the. Uh, <laughs> to make a long story long. Anyway, that's 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 what, what that's all about. So there'll be so many new. Like, um, it's hard when you start thinking about certain events and what you prioritize or not. And, you know and. We're always certainly conscientious of reaching out to s specific communities within Longmont, right? So Cinco de Mayo is very important mm -hmm. for that reason as a cultural event. So uh, Lily really wanted to be there, I agree. So that's one that will still be at, but really we'll scale it down. So we're there, but not in the same way we were last year, which required no less than 10 staff. Um, okay. Because of how we approached it. Right, we did it to ourselves, yeah. and I would love to do that, but yeah. we don't need to. It's so much work. It's a lot of work. Physically. And honestly, when people visit your tent, you've been to plenty of events. I mean, people want swag, so yeah. I'd rather spend the money on like a free pen mm -hmm. that says Longmont Library, mm -hmm. and then that's it. You know, you don't need to make the pen. Like you would yeah. Need, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we were in agreement. Yeah. There. So there'll be a few things like that. It will be at Pride, but that's a little bit easier to staff because it's a shorter event. It's only four hours. Okay. Um, but in the same sense as a, as a cultural event that gets communities in, we want to make sure we have a presence that that's also relevant. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest conversation we've had, Cynthia and the board, so as far as capacity, other Budgetary effects aren't necessarily about capacity, it's just more realization of things like collection budget numbers. Mm -hmm. You know, we one thing to share in this realm certainly is we made a number of cuts to our physical magazine collection, mm -hmm. which I am starting to get some comments about. Oh. Um, this is largely budgetary. Mm -hmm. Last year we overspent on physical magazines, but not all of it, and some of it. 
that's being pulled from those shelves are publications that already ceased in publication. We were just keeping back issues to fill space. So there's no need. And then other um, titles up there, we were very conscientious about what was decided to cancel the print to, and, and a high percentage of those are already available in Libby through our digital magazines. That's not everyone's cup of tea, right? People like to hold a physical magazine as much as I like to hold a physical book, but mm -hmm. those are those are hard decisions. Um, and so that that's something that's not necessarily staff capacity, although on some level it is for the staff to have to maintain their collection. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's really not the reason why. Ms. John, you mentioned, did I hear you right that there have been some turnover? Yeah, a little bit. Um, so we've had uh, one of our librarians up in adult services. Uh, her name was Devin Smith. Well, her name still is Devin Smith. <laughs> <laughs> She's not quite there to be. Um, yeah. But she um, <clears throat> she left. Her last day was last week. Uh, fa family reasons. She's moving uh, to Missouri somewhere. Um, really was was hard for her to leave, but. She had a big role here. She managed our homebound um, service. Um, and so one of the staff up there <clears throat> wanted to resume that responsibility. So we had the benefit of that person getting a, a good week or 10 days of overview and training from Devin to that person to help ease that transition for such an important service. So that was good. Um, and Devin also oversaw all the Libby collections. She was the, our collection development for all our e-content. E so we have another internal staff member up there that wanted to take that over. Um, and that's a good opportunity. The person that's taking that over doesn't have experience in collection development. So we're creating this opportunity. He will uh, learn this from the department manager, Penny, who we met at one of these when she was one of the ones that came here for the adult department head, um, get some coaching there, and part of the requirement for him to take that over will be to do um, some collection development coursework. Um, so he's very excited, so I think that that's great you know, to, to do that. Um, and then we've had a couple of people within our technical services area leave um, um, somewhat recently. Well, one was just Friday as well last Friday. Uh, also family reasons, one of our um, catalogers is leaving, but that's shifting some responsibility. Um, we had a part-time Spanish cataloger that was recently brought in, um, but she already had a, a job that was already nearly full-time, so I think the idea was great, but it, she could have managed both and decided that she needed to stick with the other one. Um, but what I will say, the, if there's an advantage to something like that, um, in some conversations I had with the department head for tech services that oversees that, um, I, I proposed the thought that other staff, because we have other bilingual staff within that department that could do Spanish cataloging, and then there's not a great deal of it. There's some that maybe doesn't warrant a whole position. So. Um, I'm taking that position and I'm talking with HR now and I intend to transfer those funds to outreach and actually have a position that supports that part-time, but it's, it's something to get us somewhere. Mm -hmm. So, um, good question. I'm glad you brought that up. I, Cynthia, I was going to put that in my department, my director update, but it's just fine here. So, <laughs> so that, that's some of the, the recent turnover. Thanks, John. Yeah. Um, any, any, any sense of, I'm sure this is starting right now, but any sense of timing when, when those could be built or is that just? Um, so the, um, well, with, with the, the part-time Spanish cataloger, that's, that's, so that'll be internal. So, I mean, although we have to, there's a little timing issue there because we don't have a job description that would basically be an outreach assistant right, whatever you want to call it. So we kind of have to create that um, and, and, and get that through HR and then post the position. So there's a little timing there, but um, 
uh, Deb, the librarian position up in adult services, um, that is just about ready to be posted. And and um, and actually, with that, I in speaking with the department head there, uh, because some of the responsibilities that she had are being absorbed by other staff, we are posting that job to be someone that does more outreach to the business community, um, and. Like, like a lot of big library, public libraries out there will actually have a business librarian. We're not going as far as to say that or recruit it like that, but the intention is to be uh, really be a counterpart to what Lily already does, um, but from this side of things and, and kind of engage with entrepreneurs in the business community. And, and, and I'm thinking help develop partnerships there out in Longmont. The other part of this is we're requiring um, Spanish fluency in this job, whereas usually it's preferred or some level of that, but in this case it's required. So we, we really want to recruit there to um, help build our engagement with with the growing Latino population in Delta. That sounds great. Will that stay as a librarian position? It'll stay a librarian position. That's great. All right, any other questions or comments? Okay. Well, moving on, John, let's hand it back to you oh, for yeah. any yeah. 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 Um, Although some of that I was going to cover in, in my director update, so this is just fine. Um, the there's two other items I wanted to bring up. One of them I think came up last month. I think I brought up a, a challenge we had on a graphic novel last month. But I and I think in that conversation I mentioned there's some pending um, state legislation. Yeah. Does that sound familiar? It does. Uh, okay. Talk about it? Yes. Yeah. So. Exactly. so and we yeah. talk about it. We, content so, materials in the library. Correct. This one. Yeah. Senate Bill 2409. So um, just an update on this today was um, a hearing on this with um, and, and a lot of um, testimony. Mm -hmm. They call testimony. It's basically public comment. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> uh, basically testimony. public comment. comment. Yes. Um, but they. I, I was able to tune in for a, a little bit of it. I mean, it went on for hours uh, because there was a lot of people who wanted to have something to say about it. I'm pleased to say that most of the uh, testimony shared were in support of the bill. I think that, um, you know, I might have mentioned this last month, but in, in, at the very high level, I think this is a good effort to really draw attention to the fact that maybe we do need legislation that text this basically our first amendment i mean it's sort of ridiculous in a way that we need it but given where we are in this climate that's what they're trying to do and model what some other states have done um, some people call it a ban on book bans that's um, right. um you know that's you know it's the first amendment right though <laughs> it's, it's it's kind of kind of what it is in a sense but um so they they talked about that today. I'm not really sure the next steps there, um, but anyway, it's coming back again on Wednesday, the 28th at 1:30. Okay. So they're going to have another. Oh, well, they are. It. Okay. So yeah, maybe there's they another one this this Wednesday at 1:30. This 1 Wednesday at 1:30. Those are those are things you can tune into, or at least mm -hmm. audio wise. Um, mm -hmm. I would have loved to have a video to see. Yeah. Was there. Was anyway, there, yes. um, so just just an update on that. But also internally, um, I met with our selection committee here because we have been talking about revising our um, request for reconsideration process that we have, mm -hmm. and and some of this might be informed by this legislation because. Um, it has some requirements in there if it's passed, which are things I would put in place anyway. Okay. Th things that we don't have. So one is a residency requirement to challenge. 
uh, materials in the collection. Right now, we don't state that. Um, and, I, and I think that's important. And, I, and then the other that we debated a lot as a team, but after looking at a lot of other libraries, and the legislation doesn't state this, but I'm stating it, you have to have a full use, a full access Longmont library card to challenge something. You have to be a library user. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's various opinions on this around the state of whether, uh, but, but many libraries have a comment about it. Um, so those are a couple of things we will put in place. Um, we will also mimic some of what the legislation says, although we came up with this before, which was mm -hmm. to have um, caps. So an, I, a, an item that might be formally challenged if it is, it can't be challenged again. That item cannot be challenged again for five years. So people can challenge it, but we're not going to review it because it was already challenged once. Um, and then the other side of that is a cap on how many times a person or an organization can challenge something. And I don't remember what number we came up with as a team, but there was some cap on that that way. And, and some of this is, unfortunately, this is in a response to not necessarily anything that's happened in this library, but it's certainly out there, yeah. where organizations organize themselves and do challenge after challenge, and they flood the system, and it just like, it's, so it, it's kind of setting it up so that, that we don't yeah. run into that here. Mm -hmm. So am I hearing um, that there's a cap on the number of Challenges that can be made by any one entity is it within a certain time frame, or it would be in a time frame. Months. I just don't remember when. Okay. I don't remember the time frame as a team that we talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, here. that's fine. But yes, there would be a time frame. So let's just say it's also five years, like the item. Mm -hmm. So if you, as an individual, um, or an organization challenge something, you can't challenge something. I mean, you can, it just, well, it won't right. be acknowledged, right. because it's you already did. Right, the most did. offensive form. Yeah, so you get, you get one yes. shot at it. So the, with, re, with regard to kind of flooding the system, um, that made me think also, what, what if you are inundated with a lot, what happens to the materials while they're being reviewed? Are they still available or do they get pulled while they're under review? No, my policy and our current policy states this actually, but it, it will remain. Um, anything that gets um, formally challenged through the request for reconsideration, it states in there that the item will remain on the shelves or if they're challenging a display or a program, that it will remain on display or the program will be canceled. Okay, I think that's great because then you don't have to worry about being flooded. You can't use flooding the system as a strategy. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you haven't noticed any um, items disappearing? No. From the collection? No, we haven't had that here. And that has happened in places. Um, so that anyway, that's where we are on, uh, internally on this process, and then you can look up the, the legislation too and mm -hmm. kind of see what's going on there. Um, so that's that, and then the other thing I have, which um, I wanted to share, this group here. So um, I haven't even brought this up here yet, but we. We're gathering, we, every year we gather um, a number of, of statistical components as a requirement that we file with the state library. And so I've been trying to work, uh, and Tracy's done a lot of this, of simplifying how we gather this information. And it made it much easier to then gather data that we have and bury it. It's kind of like, it exists in various places. So, we're kind of streamlining that, and then my marketing person took that and made basically an annual report. And um, what I'm trying to do is show you this um, really quickly. Where is it? I'm like, where did it share?
Uh, is this visible on my screen to you folks online? So that's the agenda. You don't need to see that. This is the annual report that, that um, my marketing person compiled. Um, and, and this could be something too, you know, I, I know this board talks about various communications with council, but it would be great to incorporate this in communications that you have and even present an annual report to council. Mm -hmm. um, many boards do this. Some have requirements to do it. Um, but I'll just show you quickly what this looks like. So it captures some key data points mm -hmm. um, of what we're doing. And I will definitely send this out, so don't feel like you have to capture this out now. In fact, some of these numbers just came in today. That's mm -hmm. why I uh, and Cynthia, when we met, I didn't mention this because I didn't have it yet. So, um, so <clears throat> this is a lot of programming numbers here. Mm -hmm. um, you get down and then digital usage. Um, mm -hmm. and, and this, I think, is good. We're, we're separating. So this is the, the 433,000 is what Longmont has done between ebooks and databases. Mm -hmm. Just ebooks is 223. But it's worth pointing out, you know, our ebook and the audio, the Libby collection is shared, right? That's a consortial uh, partnership we have with Lafayette, Louisville, Broomfield, and Loveland. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and we broke a record this year by hitting wow. over a million checkouts on that between the libraries. And out of that million, we have, what, almost, well, 200,000. Um, that's a lot of use. If you want to prove to people the library's being used, yeah. and even if they're not coming in, these are the numbers you can share. <laughs> right? Um, <clears throat> and then physical materials, we all got close to a million circulating out of this library, which is a lot of library use in a year. Um, almost 70,000 holds retrieved. It's probably more holds were placed, but Okay. We, we're not counting the ones that people decided not to pick up. Okay. Um, that can be reported. Um, and then it's broken down between areas here. Um, worth mentioning things like Discovery Passes, 1400. That's that 100% friends funded yeah. to go to museums and other things. Same with library things, over 500 items checked out from library things. We don't even have that one in our collection. So, happy to talk through any of this, but I'll send this out and you can even put this as old business again next month if you want, since this is new. Um, over 5,000 new library cards issued last year. Um, top, top digital downloads. And then, then there's a whole marketing to show mm -hmm. our e-newsletter engagement. Um, here and then our, our website engagement. I'm pretty sure the library's homepage is the most visited site in the entire city of Longmont website. Um, so you get, it's really broken down here because this is the marketing person. So she, she got very detailed in, in, in what her, her realm is. Um, and then events and programs as it relates to online. Um, we don't do a whole lot of registration, you know, so, but that, when it says events sold out, and obviously we don't charge for them. Mm -hmm. But when we do registration, you know, author events and things, yeah. so these are 36 of them in a year, mm -hmm. um, we're at full capacity. Um, and then the last part is social media engagement, which is largely Facebook. So, again, I know I'm scrolling through fast, but I, I, I just wanted to share this with you. I'll get it to the board and, and um, oh, this would be something good for the Oh, for see. sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. You hear presentations all the time. And, and, and part of. Um, Part of my conversations with staff here mm -hmm. with our, our number gathering is I wanted 
in a way where I can extract, I don't know if it'll be this fancy, mm -hmm. but something where I can create a little quarterly report that yeah. then can be presented to the council yeah. to show like what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I just don't, I, I think if you don't see it, a lot of people mm -hmm. just don't know. And you hear, yeah. you hear it out there, right? Mm -hmm. Like, well, I don't, I mean, even someone today in the legislative session, mm -hmm. I mean, he admitted he was a legislator. He's like, I, I love the library, I'll support anything. I, but I, I know for me, like, I get what I need largely without it. Mm -hmm. Except that I check out physical books, yeah. but I recognize people need it, and it's like, yeah, and let me show you how. Yeah, <laughs> you know, because yeah. I just don't think that that people yeah. see that. So. And that was what that was the other point of conversation that I had with council was the hidden costs, things that we don't really see, yeah. but these are costs that are incurring. These are actions that are happening. You know, people are tapping into these digital collections. A lot and but we're not because we're not physically seeing this yeah. you know it doesn't mean that it, it's not happening it's not hey John I have one question on one of the statistics in there you don't have to reshare it the very first statistic said that a hundred there was hundred and twenty thousand people is that a duplicated or unduplicated number no it's on it, it's a total of People that attended programs between adult, children, outreach, and otherwise. Um, so it's it's it, it was couched as engagement. So it's mm -hmm. if, if you looked individually, it would add up between adult, children, and outreach to one hundred twenty-three thousand people. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, John, and thanks for sending this out. Um, I agree. This would be great for council to see. Um, I think I've been a member of this board the longest, which is very odd to me. But in, in my time here, we have not presented to council, nor has it come up. So I think it's something we should do. Susie or, or Tracy, John, how, how do we make that happen? Any suggestions? You know, we can go about a couple of ways. You know, one, the mayor can request it. When she's writing up the agenda, she can just have that put in. Um, I can request to have that be part of a presentation or a, um, I think there's, so we have, not general business, I think it would be a special report and presentation to have, to request to have you all come in. But I'd probably wait until you, you know, you kind of give me the, the cue that, okay, we're ready to present this. And, you know, I don't yeah. know if it has to be accepted by the board or whatever. So there, there are a couple, a couple of ways that it comes back to us. Things come back in um, special reports and presentations. Yeah, Cynthia, I think um, what, what Susie said is the best way would be to just be, try to get it on the agenda in that sense, not not just try to come in during mm -hmm. uh, public invited we've heard, but actually be on the agenda to present it. As the library's 2023 annual report, and that's something that the board could, this board could decide. You know, I mean, the, the report's there, so you know, um, I, I don't think there would be much tweaking to it at this point. It would be much uh, more of a matter of timing and, and when groups here, people here, decide who and, and when people. I mean, that stuff gets booked out a little bit, so mm -hmm. you know. It's hard to know when it would be, but try to put that in process. From my perspective, it would make sense to go ahead and put it in process. Um, what do you, what do the other board members think? And of course, yeah, and, and I, I can. I'm not sure when that works. You is that the board members presenting or the director or I, I mean I'm happy to. I can't contextualize it in the same way John can, but I'm happy to. <laughs> we, we, we could, you know, at the end of the day, we, we could work together, whoever presents it, so there's a, a, a better, you know, intimate understanding of it. But generally, it would be the board presenting. I would certainly be there to help answer questions, which, would, which presumably could come up. Like, well, just like Katie answered, like, what does that number mean, you know? So if we get into that, I would certainly be there, but it's generally would be a board presentation. Okay. 
Okay. Um, yeah, that that would be great, Susie. Um, if we can request that, would it be helpful if I emailed you tomorrow? Sure. With that request. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I, don't we don't know, I don't even know the like the formal process to get. So um, yes, yeah, so there are the two ways that I've seen things happen is that the mayor will just put it on the agenda. So when she sets the agenda with Harold, they'll they'll decide what you know what's to come forward, and then other times it's a council member requesting, I'd like to hear from you know, so and so. I you know, I made a motion a few weeks ago to have open space, you know, the, the department to come out and do a presentation on, you know, what areas do we have log, you know, sectioned off for true open space and natural preserve areas. We were getting a lot of questions from residents saying that we're kind of cutting cutting down these areas or and we're actually not. We're expanding some of our open space. So really an informational meeting that'll be coming, you know, a few months ahead. But uh, so that you know I've seen it happen both ways. So uh, you know I can ask the mayor and you know if she says just just make a motion I'll I'll do that. So to And me, then I don't we don't have to set a day. Right. I could just get it so it's on the docket to come sometime in the near future. Thanks, Susie, for, for helping with that. I, I think, uh, Katie or Matt, Jamie, it sounded like you were in agreement. What, what do you all think? Any comments to add? Just that, you know, when during um, the weeks leading up to the election, um, one of the frustrating things that I heard most frequently was that, you know, some variation of a Longmont resident not knowing about dot dot dot, not knowing anything about the library, you know, all of its many services, and um, also the needs specifically. And this was there's someone else maybe in this room who shared my sentiments, either here or on the friends board, where um, way after the election we're talking with somebody about the library, and it comes up you know, what is really needed? What are the gaps here? And how is it potentially going to impact the community long term? Mm -hmm. And the person's like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. And it's like, we just, we just had this on the ballot. Mm -hmm. There was all this information out there mm -hmm. in the ether and you knew nothing that the library needed more funds to operate. And, and he was like, no. So I think that's still, out there that people selectively take in mm -hmm. information and often if they don't see if they're not confronted personally with a visual of the crisis then it, it somehow doesn't land right because it's in competition with all of these other needs and, and uh, in, we're in information oversaturated culture um, so I think any opportunity that the library has to get out in front of um, decision makers, in front of the public, and say, look, look at what we're doing, look at how much we're doing, right? One of the comments I heard all the time was, why does the library need more money? Every time I go there, there's no one there. It's never crowded. They seem like they have enough space. What they're not seeing are all of these the activity that's happening online or from people's yeah. homes or you know the programs that just again aren't right in front of you when you walk through the door to pick up your hold you don't see the you know making it up 100 200 people stuffed into a room mm -hmm. you know, in the nearest children yeah department mm -hmm. so yeah it's just um publicity right it's it's keeping Education. the community informed yeah. yep Yeah, I agree. Any other comments? Okay, right, Susie, I'll, I'll email you tomorrow just to kind of uh, so we can uh, make sure um, and remember that for me. Um, 
And then, yeah, let's let's go ahead and, and try to get on, get on the agenda in the upcoming months. Thanks for sharing that, John. Anything else but in the director's report before we move on? Nope, that's all I have. Great. Right. I need to switch screens tomorrow, which is next, and I think it is friends. Yep. Any rep uh, report from the Friends of the Library liaison? Um, I, I was not able to attend uh, last week's meeting. Um, maybe there's the nugget. I, John, you were there. You could share the highlight. But I, um, for my part, it's just been getting ready for the sale, which starts on Wednesday. Saturday and um, the other conversation topics I know are sort of top of mind um, on the Friends Board is um, there are I think there are two spots on the board that are potentially opening up in the not too distant future I think there's one spot that is opening up um, in the next couple of months with uh, the The vice president stepping down and then there might be some shuffle internally and then um, launched this whole big long conversation last month around um, what do you call it like legacy planning and um, not only needing to recruit more members and volunteers within the friends but to then recruit some of those recruits to join the board, right? And discussing, you know, um, the various approaches to that and maybe what types of strategies, what types of outreach um, would make the most sense. But there was kind of like this little wake up ripple that I saw go through the room. Um, you know, it was like, oh yeah, when's my turn ending? When's my turn ending? And like, we, we're gonna need some, some new people in the pipeline. Um, to fill these roles in the next, you know, anywhere from the next couple of months to the, the next two years. Um, so then that connected with it, they're, they're talking about it, uh, their upcoming retreat and what um, agenda items might be most uh, highest priority for their retreat, talking about membership and, um, and development, like really sort of fleshing out uh, a membership program or a donor program that has a little bit more uh, structure to it, has uh, maybe some more tiers and some clearer benefits and some clearer language around um, what that support translates into, literally, in terms of the impact that your membership dollars have, just like you would hear on a you know, an NPR or CPR membership drive. Like, friends can be adapting some more of that language instead of, um, I think I think the model that they've had, it's not helping them to grow. And they're gonna need to grow to meet goals, uh, to be able to, to help the library at the same level that they've been helping the library <coughs> in the past. Uh, I'm trying to think if I'm leaving anything out. Um, there's a lot of things that were kind of interwoven, um, uh, returning to the question of upgrading the website and, um, you know, the whole uh, client relations management software that's connected to that. And so I don't, I don't know where those conversations will lead. Um, some of them are certainly complex enough that they it would make sense to have them in a, a retreat type setting to, to allow for more creative, like longer conversation, more iterative conversation. Um, but yeah, like a little growing pains is kind of exciting. Um, and the sale. Well, it's about the sale. They're doing really well uh, between the bookshop and um, what we're bringing with the sales. Yeah, I mean, one thing I can add from that meeting yeah. that they're going to do at the, at the sale mm -hmm. um, is have some signage around. They, they showed a sample that 
it basically lists out all the various things that their funding fund, their their support funds. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you buy books, this is what you're funding, and then it lists all things, all of these things out: library right. of things, discovery, whatever you you name it, it's there. And I, you know, so I think that that that's not a bad idea to let people know what is my money actually going to. Well, it's going to the, all these programs. So that was one thought they had that they plan to implement this next sale. Mm -hmm. And then um, the Friends Chair um, sent me a, a note that they want to send to Council that is to let Council know or, or maybe remind Council that the library depends on the Friends for 100% of programming. Um, and so that, that'll be getting sent out. So I think they're also, in addition to everything that Jamie just said, I think they're trying to think about how can we increase communication that really lets people know exactly what this is going towards mm -hmm. right. um, and why it's so important. So. Hey, Green, I'm curious uh, if they brought up um, the idea again of having um, a library of books that have a little table in the corner during the sale where instead of telling people or asking them about membership, point of sale have a separate location for those conversations that has for membership used, yeah when you said signage it made me remember I don't I don't do you remember Tracy that detail I don't specifically for like memberships I think they were wanting to kind of yeah. have more discussions with patrons not related to the sale I don't know if it was specifically for memberships but mm -hmm. probably along the same lines yes yeah, yeah. like that but I think there was some dissension with the board members and of how realistic that is within the space they have available for the sale. That's true. Mm -hmm. so that's probably true. And the the staffing too, just yeah. you know, how um, how many other people beyond the members of that board actually sign up to you know sit there at the tables. Um, my experience has been that it is. More than half board members can't do all of that. It's all right. So I don't. I don't have anything else for the tea lady. Um, well, thanks for for that. And for those who don't know, I just want to mention that Jamie also volunteers at this sales and oh, so cool. recognize your efforts there as well. Um, and and I hope that you know. And I think this is this is on a set in communications. When we do share about programming coming from the friends, how unusual that is, and, and how that is not the ideal function or role of of that group. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions for for Jamie and, and John on that? All right. Well, let's move on to our city council liaison, and so Susie will okay. pass it to you. Yeah. So you know, I kind of embedded a little bit of stuff going on. But again, you know, just informing the council of what um, the needs of the library are, especially as you start thinking about, you know, the pre stages of budget, planning the budget. Um, you know, a couple of things that will be coming up to council that we'll be talking tomorrow is um, our 4th of July event. So in the past, we used to have it at the Boulder County Fairgrounds. They canceled that space uh, during COVID. And then um, one of the things, and I, I guess there were other conversations that I really wasn't aware of as to why um, they decided to stay at Fox Hill Golf Course, um, including, you know, really concerns for um, from public safety around being able to manage the fallout zone and traffic impacts um, in and around the, um, you know, Hover and Rogers Grove, you know, that whole area. So I think that as our population has increased, that area they were determining was less and less feasible. Uh, Kiwanis, Public Safety, and Boulder County. So then they had it at Fox Hill Golf Course, but, you know, there were concerns that arose there with it being close to the hospital, um, you know, it's kind of, it's far away from the city center. So, you know, there was an equity piece around 
you know, people before would just be able to go outside of their homes and watch the fireworks, where then a lot of people in town were having to drive to the outskirts to be able to see. And Fox Hill Golf Course, it's a private place, space. So, you know, again, it was, you know, having to pay to, you know, access food trucks or, you know, whatever they had there. So, um, you know, so we're going to be talking about it tomorrow. Personally, I would like to see it come back to Boulder County or Boulder County Fairgrounds somewhere in the center. Um, you know, I heard from residents about, you know, that we're going to have it at Dickens and I have not heard about that. That's on my packet. And so I was like kind of taken aback where this idea came from. But we're, we're going to be discussing it all tomorrow as well. And then other things that we're going to be discussing in relation to the 4th of July will be the possibility of moving it to a drone show instead of fireworks because of climate, dry brush, you know, the concerns for wildfires. Um, so that again, that's going to be, a, you know, we're going to kind of mull around the two topics. <laughs> see what's going on there. <laughs> I mean, my feeling is, okay, well, let's give it a try. If it's flops, right. we have next year. You know, it's, you know, we just won't know if we don't try. I don't hear comments. Either way. Oh, yes, yes. Uh -huh. <coughs> so, you know, and the other, you know, there's things that we could, what we're trying to do is kind of create a, a space where maybe we just don't have the fireworks show, but we also, by itself, but we also have, you know, kind of like carnival games, food trucks, you know, different other activities as well. So picnicking, live music. So to kind of make it as an event type of thing. So, but it does need to be closer to the center of the city. Not, you know, I, I'm not a fan of it being over where, where it has been. And I think, yeah, so I think one of them, Boulder County Fairgrounds, Dickens Farm, um, yeah. I don't know. So we're just gonna be exploring other other options and how we can bring it, bring it back. Another item that will be coming, and it, this was brought forward by Council Member Yarborough, was around compensation for city council. So currently, Every two weeks, I bring home my $380 check <laughs> for my work I do on council. And, you know, it's, I'm not, that's why I work full time. So <laughs> I can't afford to do both. But, um, you know, one of the things that we were looking at was really at sustainability. So, not necessarily for those of us who are sitting on council now, but long term, you know, for the next group of people coming in. And, you know, really, our community has been very vocal about wanting to have representatives who represent the community. So we have a large portion of people who are working class individuals. So really having that kind of representation on council. Um, and we're not going to get it with the pay that, that we have. Um, because, you know, again, people who can afford to stay at home or who can afford to cut part time to devote the time needed for, to run, you know, to be council or mayor, um, you know, they, they wouldn't be able to afford to do that. So I think for her, one of the arguments was really looking at long term. Um, and then, you know, we, we were going to be looking at comparable cities, you know, Fort Collins. Their council members make 300 or 3,321 a month, and our council, we, you know, before taxes, um, we're a thousand, and I think the mayor is 1,500. So in Fort Collins, then their mayor makes a little under 5,000 a month, council makes a little more than 3,000 a month. So it's, you know, we're going to be looking at different. Communities, there are other communities, Aurora, council members and mayor, they all make a little under 1800 a month, that's it. So, you know, we're gonna have a discussion around that as well. And again, that'll be met with opposition and anger and <laughs> discontent. So, um, you know, we had our, our um, monthly council retreat or our annual council retreat, and we went over, looked at our, our 
goals and objectives or priorities that again they continue to be housing transportation and um, early childhood education so how that those goals really fit into everything else that we're doing as a city around equity sustainability core services uh, you know making sure that as we expand housing that our the core services we provide to the community is sufficient sustainable and accessible uh, transportation we're moving towards vision zero so really that multimodal sharing the road with pedestrians, cyclists, and cars. We're you know, moving away from that idea of car-centric, and really we're sharing the road with, with many different types of um, past, you know, participants. And um, the other thing we recently were working with different agencies around microtransit. So instead of the large buses through RTD, you know, just smaller vans and um, you know, like the VIA type services and having where we're able to get these vehicles out there more frequently to pick up and drop off passengers. We're working with RTD to expand services. You know, when they do the cutoff time at eight o'clock it's really not feasible for people who are depending on public transportation. That's the cutoff. That's the cutoff. So we've had um, residents who said, you know, they want to come to public invited to be heard at council, but they know they have to be back on the bus by eight o'clock or before eight so they can get back home before they end service. So I know that we have flex and other types of Trans, um, public transportation that run, maybe run a little bit later. But yeah, that was, um, yeah, so that's that's kind of what we're exploring and seeing how we can expand services. I know RTD really doesn't want to expand services if the ridership is low, but what we're saying is ridership is low because you have not expanded services exactly. it's very inconvenient right. if you expand these services make these stops more frequent um, it, you know ex extend the morning and evening times you'll get more ridership so we're kind of going back and forth with it so it's like literally the chicken before the egg kind of thing so we'll we'll see and doing whatever we can to fund it through grants, federal funds, ARPA dollars, on how we can fund the transportation as well as the housing, housing component. And then I think that was, oh, that was it. I think the last time they raised the 99? No. They raised the council pay. Yeah, it was. 1999 so <laughs> well nothing's really changed yeah no nothing <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness so any questions or i'd be happy to you know if there's anything oh you know tell me more about that we can you know, connect or send you an email well i i personally really hope that they do raise Station, I think it's so important and y'all devote so much time and energy to this. Um, I guess the only comment I had is, you know, when I, when I hear early childhood education is one of the council retreat goals, mm -hmm. uh, such a tie-in, of course, with library services. Um, so did that come up at all? Yes. In that conversation? Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, how we, we have these programming. You know what I think one of the places we're connecting with is a wild plum what's the one that's near here TLC or is it what Aspen. well there's an early childhood the there's Aspen right? Aspen yeah. that's what it is so you know being able to connect library services with some of these nearby yeah. Um, child care facilities, especially ones, you know, your Head Start, your, I think TLC also serves low income. So, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity there if, you know, we provide the funding for. So. 
thank you so much for that update. Um, my next standing, oh, I should pause. Any other questions or comments? Great. Our next standing agenda item is library profession news. We talked at fair a bit about that already um, for what's happening in the state legislature right now. Uh, anyone else have anything else to bring for that? I do. Agenda item. Go for it. Um, so last month, uh, I, you may remember, I briefly mentioned this uh, librarian individual that uh, was just starting to kind of explode into a, what I would call mainstream awareness, right? And I couldn't remember their name at the time, but it's Michael Fleets. And I had oh, been, so yeah, I had been following that um, Instagram account for some time and was just absolutely delighted that this librarian um, was getting so much positive, uh, infectious attention for our public libraries in just the most uh, non, the, the most inclusive way that you can imagine. And so I was really excited to tell all of you about, uh, about him last month. And I was like, I gotta remember, you know, get the, the right name so, or the link so that you can share it out and everything. Then I saw in my feed that Michael was invited to be the keynote speaker for CalCon 24. I was like, oh my gosh, this is perfect, this is amazing. I gotta write this down, I gotta tell, the, you know, at the next board meeting, I gotta I'll share that this is happening too because this is like the, the awareness. And now, as I uh, was preparing for this meeting, I saw that Michael Foods is resigning from his position because all of that fame and exposure that brought such light to public libraries around this country had also brought out a lot of... Um, this call. Yes, <laughs> yes, a, a lot of less positive energies that were very unfortunately directed at him and making it not only um, untenable to do his job, but untenable to, you know, difficult to maintain one's mental health. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know yet. This just happened a day ago is when it was being reported, so I don't know if, um, if, if Michael will still be participating in Calcon. It sounds like um, he's stepping away from his position at the library, but he's not stepping away from li library advocacy and would like to um, have more conversations, you know, uh, even the national um, level with, with lawmakers and so forth. So all that to say, I'm very, very concerned about our country. I'm very concerned about our librarians. I'm very concerned about the ones who are uh, working today and the ones um, who, who might be uh, vulnerable to being driven out, um, and the ones that haven't entered the field yet, and who may be discouraged from doing so, uh, as more and more of these unfortunate events take place. Paired with that, like a final, is HB 1661 in Tennessee, which I, I I saved, I could have brought it up when you mentioned, uh, John, the, the Colorado bill. But this was another thing that just kind of rolled across my radar and I was like, what? I'm afraid that it's precedent setting. Basically, it's a bill to lower the barriers for community members to have materials removed from public libraries. So to make it even easier and the language that was being used um, by the proponents of said bill was very slippery and um, sounded like it was going to be, you know, they were doing this to help the libraries, you know? Let us come in and take these books off your shelves before an angry community member comes forward. You know, we can proactively, preemptively remove these things. And if we just let 
if we just let the um, residents decide what they consider to be their community standards for obscenity or inappropriate material, right? Like, don't worry about all this First Amendment stuff. Um, because we here in our little town of, is it Oak Ridge or something, Tennessee, you know, we really know that this, that, that stuff doesn't belong here. It's, it's, I would say it's unbelievable, except that enough of this kind of thing is happening now that it is all too believable. But I wanted to bring it to our group's attention because I think um, things like what John is moving forward with, already having these conversations about uh, updating the challenge request form. Um, it, it's kind of like we're already um, supporting legislature in Colorado to lock down, you know, no bans. This is what we mean by free speech, stuff like that. Like proactively do it now. Do it now so that, you know, if, if some of these experimental bills uh, start making their way toward us, uh, hopefully we have some, some things in place uh, that the, those things just keep on going. They go, they go, <laughs> they go on to some other uh, library or state. Not good. They're coming. They're coming. For, it was that you know. It was all the the school library stuff that we, that I was hearing about the most for a few months, and now it's starting to be more public library stuff. And, like sound alarm. Yeah, I mean, it's Arkansas for sure. I think Alabama, they, they have some some things in place that are horrifying, like some laws or, or policies or such that affect public libraries. In Arkansas, particularly, mm -hmm. librarians can be brought up on charges. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there's there is some wild stuff out there. Mm -hmm. I say wild, but I hope that. Whatever this is, that, that remains like, no, you, you guys are whatever, but mm -hmm. don't don't have this be a, a thing that starts growing. I don't think it will, but it's still disturbing. Mm -hmm. Very much so. And I'm very concerned that these things are going to start. Uh, I'm not starting that they're going to increasingly. Uh, Disincentivize people from staying in the field, which is returning to the field. Similar to what this is going to be. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for bringing that to our attention. I think that's, uh, gosh, a very sad and important conversation to pay attention to, even if it's not, you know, even if our state is. Uh, moving in a different direction. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, CalCon is the Colorado Association of Library Conference. This year it's at Breckenridge. I haven't attended for many years, but when I have, it's been great. Uh, it's in early September and uh, it's open. So, I mean, it, it costs the money. But, um, and, and I want to check this because I'm saying this from my understanding without looking. But, um, I, I'm, you know, as board members, we, we uh, could attend. Uh, once again, it does. There is a fee associated. Um, John, I, I know y'all are uh, going to the public library conference. I think it's in April. Um, I, I hope that there is funding for y'all to go to the Calcon if that would be in, uh, of use to you and some of your staff. I mean, you know, um, last, I'm not sure if that is. Well, last year it was easier because it was in Loveland which it had been for many years, um, you know, with with PLA and the staff going, of course, I, I, I got funding for that from the friends, but, but my existing professional development budget would, would barely support that because then it's, it's, it's far enough to require, you know, more financial commitment, right? So mileage and obviously room and board and 
that adds up quickly, so that's going to be pretty challenging. But it's not out of the question, you know, at least to maybe get one or two people. But with CalCon, when it was in Loveland, I was able to send a number of people, and so that was that was great. But um, we'll see. But you're right, like uh, boards and commissions. In fact, they they have specific tracks sometimes, or at least sessions for that. Some of it's, you know. It depends on the conference, but there's usually these sessions that are specific to boards and commissions. So it's it's worth looking at if they've gotten far enough to have any specific sessions or agenda like that. So far, the, the person that Jamie brought up is still on the agenda because they just sent that out today. But his his announcement of resigning was so recent that I don't know, you know if, if that were made or not. Well, I'll, I'll try to keep an eye out and see uh, what if, if there is a session specific to the boards and commissions and send that out to this group. Uh, all right, moving on. Um, library board comments. Any further comments from any members of the board? So, okay, our next thing. Okay. Oh, no, I'm just going to say because I'm not library board at this point, but. I wanted to share something with the board at the end of the meeting, so if there's no board comments, I can do that now. This might end this on a, a, a little more positive note than censorship, yes. <laughs> um, which is we need to talk about, but I just wanted to share with this board, I received a thank you note today, randomly. Um, this, this doesn't happen very often. Usually if I get a note in the mail, it's something I probably don't want to read. Um, but this is short, so I'll read it to you all. Um, my husband and I moved to Longmont a couple of years ago and are so impressed with the services the Longmont Library provides. We appreciate being able to hold books and pick them up from the library. This is a tremendous service. Recently, we have noted your offerings of Library of Things, the Seed Garden, and the multiple CD and DVD offerings, and audiobooks. Congratulations also on your very effective ways to engage a diverse community. Signed, a happy patron. So I just wanted to share that because for someone to take the time to write something, and you know, we all know how that goes. Most feedback people are willing to leave is not this nature. So yeah. I just thought you guys would all appreciate hearing that. I did. It's, it's, it's a good way to start really the part yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. I thought about writing a thank you note for the thank you note. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I want to include that as we, uh, somebody to consider when we do share the email for a console. Um, that type of feedback as well is so powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, oh, the, so. and a, another a staff member told me too over the weekend a patron was up in the computer lab and stopped one of the staff and just said, you know, I just wanted to say that I got my high school degree because of this library. I did all my coursework here, and without it, I wouldn't have a high school degree. So talk yeah. about a story to share. Yeah. I know. What's your name? Well, no, yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Welcome yeah. and put it on yeah. Yeah, I know the anecdotal. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's awesome. Oh, thanks. That is a great note to end on. Mm -hmm. um, right, our next meeting is scheduled March 18th. That is the first day of St. Rain Spring Break. Um, so if somebody that I makes come not able to attend, please just let us know. Make sure we'll have a quorum. Um, but otherwise, I will adjourn us at 8.53.